Welcome to the Ecosystems in Action mini conference presented by the Coffin Foundation. My name is Lauren Higgins. In our second session today, we're going to be looking at the practice of collective impact in the session called Using a Collective Impact Approach to Mobilize a City's Entrepreneurial Ecosystem. This session will feature us actually two speakers today. There's uh, one surprise. I'll let him introduce himself later. But first, uh, Robin Brule will be here with us. And she is the former strategist, chief strategist from City Alive and now is currently the senior director in philanthropic partnerships at Philan Research Institute. The practice of collective impact it's going to be covered in our upcoming brief. So you'll get a little bit of a preview today in the conversation with Robin. And the this published brief is going to be called Using a Collective Impact Model to Mobilize a City's Entrepreneurial Ecosystem to Boost Economic Recovery. And within the brief, we highlight the collective impact model through the story of City Alive. In, it, in Albuquerque, and it focuses on how they use the model and specifically the five conditions of collective impact over time to organize a coalition of working groups focused on growing an inclusive entrepreneurial ecosystem in Albuquerque. Uh, collective impact is a practice that uses centralized infrastructure, a dedicated staff, and shared measurement, continuous communication, and mutually reinforcing activities among participants. It was first articulated in a 2001 Stanford Social Innovation Review article called Collective Impact, and it's been used across many fields like education um, to and the economy to be applied to a variety of, or supporting and solving a variety of complex social issues. Finally, the collective impact model offers a process for collective action that maximizes multiple stakeholder collaboration options and achieve results that no one single organization or individual could do alone. It is a commitment by actors from different sectors to take a shared systemic approach to complex social problems. And so we really look forward to digging into how collective impact work in this one case in Albuquerque and giving you a better sense of that practice. And we're going to be exploring that through the story of City Alive and the work that happened to strengthen the entrepreneurial ecosystem in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And our special guest uh, with us today is Robin Brule and also one of her colleagues, Rob, Robert Del Campo, which will be uh, having join us here shortly as well. And so without further ado, um, Robin, we can jump in with a short presentation from you and then we'll open it up into Q&A and learn more about collective impact and your approach and, and dive deeper there. So over to you, Robin. Thanks so much. Um, really appreciate being here. And I love the last panel. I agree with everything they said we've experienced in Albuquerque. So thanks for having us here today. I love the story of City Alive and what we were doing in Albuquerque, New Mexico. We were utilizing a collective impact approach to mobilize our city's entrepreneurial ecosystem to boost economic recovery, to strengthen homegrown job creation, and to support um, closing racial economic wealth gaps. And I'm gonna go really fast through this PowerPoint, but one thing to note is this is all still available on our website and exists to this day. When we first started, we really um, embraced the collective impact approach, things that you've already mentioned around centralized infrastructure, re reinforcing activities, data. And we focused on the four types of entrepreneurs and a strengths-based approach, recognizing that there's no one leader or one system responsible for the economic challenges that we faced in our city. There's no one leader or one system that could fix them. And if we really wanted a better Albuquerque, we needed to work collectively together. So these are the four types of entrepreneurs that we were focusing with and on. Innovation-led, microenterprise, Main Street, Second Stage. And Albuquerque has a very rich, rich history of entrepreneurial growth and lots and lots of assets in these areas. These are our partners. These were the main partners who sat at the table. Now there are many, many others who were involved and engaged, community organizations, nonprofits, entrepreneur support organizations, but these were the central um, organizations and team members that stepped up to say, yes, we're gonna do this and we're gonna work collaboratively to do this. And we have our mission, our vision and our values. And I think it was really essential for us to 
write down these values and say everybody who's joining us at the table to work collectively needs to embrace this or else we will not be able to work together if we don't fundamentally agree on these things then we're not going to be able to move forward effectively so how we work together um, our goals to tackle the shared priorities were really around um, to cultivate and encourage small business build a culture of entrepreneurship and inclusion, create a more friend, user-friendly support ecosystem, develop alternative ways for businesses to access capital, and develop talent and skills needed for the next generation of leaders. So those sound like pretty big buckets. How do you do that? And so if you had a policy, a program, a resource, or a provider that touched upon any one of these things directly supporting entrepreneurs or the entrepreneurial ecosystem, you were invited to join us because you had assets that you could then be flexible with and help shape um, what needed to happen next. And you can see how we work together around the different things that we were strategizing about. So our shared governance structure started off um, very interestingly and different than how it ended up evolving too. And I think it's important to note because when you're doing collective impact, it may feel and look one way when you first start and it will morph and iterate over time based on the needs and what's happening and what's being un uncovered and the different things that are changing in your ecosystem. So our shared governance structure at first was an executive leadership table that was comprised of our mayor at that time, the president of the University of New Mexico, and the head of the credit union that I worked for. Those were the three leaders that came together and said, we need to join forces and help support um, Albuquerque's economic growth and home job, homegrown job creation. We're going to put our resources together to help figure this out. And then we broke into what we called tables that were specifically focused on different kinds of entrepreneurs so that we had a way to segment our, res our resources and a way to have people come to the table and collaborate together. So we focused on tech, access to capital. Um, the Molina table was originally called the entrepreneurship and inclusion was really focused on small business development and racial equity, those furthest from wealth and power who don't interact many times with systems based on trust, our venture table and the diet table, which was our data. We also started with a community table, which was really our infrastructure. So looking at what what does our city have to offer entrepreneurs from an infrastructure standpoint? Are there shared learning spaces? Are there maker spaces? Is there transportation? Is there ability to have the kind of fiber you need? So that was looked at as well. And we had rules of engagement, and these were really important to us as well. And um, the, the prior session talked a lot about trust building. There is a lot of trust building that goes into this. Um, from the very beginning throughout. And there are ways that we had to learn to work with each other and talk to each other and share information with each other, given especially the amount of people who were involved in this and the long-term goals that we had. So this chart represents our first year. We started our first year in 2013, 2014 as what we call the planning year. We knew we wanted to focus on homegrown, inclusive, entrepreneurial economic development focused on closing racial wealth gaps. How do we do that? And how do we put the entrepreneurs in the center of that work? Because we can all sit here and tell you what we think entrepreneurs need, but they need to tell us what they need. So we did a planning year and we invited all kinds of entrepreneurs to come to the table and tell us three simple questions. What's working? What's not working? And what would one thing would you change if you had the ability to change anything? And that informed the work of our tables. And we did this at different hours of night because I think it's really important to know that, of course, many entrepreneurs don't have a typical nine to five job. They can't show up at a lunch meeting to talk about this. We provided support for food and for childcare and other things. We offered these sessions in different languages to make sure that we were not um, just focusing on one type of community culture or race. So 
we had over 180 stakeholder participants, entrepreneurs coming and telling us what they needed, what was working, what wasn't working, what we needed to add, and what we needed to continue to do. And so this represents our planning year of all the different activities that we undertook to help form our strategies on what we were going to work on collaboratively. This is how our tables originally worked. And I call this the wedding banquet. Um, this came out of the original SSIR work and the Living Cities work of how do you structure collective impact tables? Like how do you, how do you coalesce and how do you actually create a framework? So that steering table you see are the chairs of all the different tables or what we call the working groups coming together. And so the working tables would come together and meet and talk about the things that they learned. Um, also, what I will add from the planning year, it was somewhat of a SWOT analysis. Where are the gaps? Where are the strengths? What do we already have? Again, asset-based, but really what is missing from our ecosystem that we need to figure out? So after that planning year and after the tables were set, we began to note our strategies in action and highlighting our progress to date. So our goals kept getting more and more refined on the activity, sorry, our goals stayed broad, but the activities under them kept getting more and more refined. And this is a chart showing, you know, some of our original goals and then certain things that happened underneath those goals with the partners coming together and having um, resources and leveraging and collaborations to create those things. Um, I'll note that Innovate ABQ, which Rob is going to talk about, Professor Del Campo, who I'll introduce in a second, um, was really one of the um, original events that led to all this. So how do you create a rainforest in the desert? Um, how do you make sure you're taking advantage of your resources? We had amazing resources through our labs and through our universities and our education centers on technology and tech transfer, but we weren't coordinating it and sequencing in the way we needed to. So we created this Innovate ABQ that helped with the rainforest approach. But then you look at the Emprendedores program, which was specifically focused on immigrant entrepreneurs, specifically from South America or Mexico, who absolutely did not feel like they were engaged with the city or could be. And so how do you offer a supportive environment to those who are speaking a different language? Um, we're oftentimes operating on the fringe because of rules and regulations and other things that were happening and provide them with the support they need. So um, as I stated in the beginning, we really wanted to focus on all of this work with racial equity in the center, as well as entrepreneurs and closing racial wealth gaps. And how do we do that? So we looked specifically at certain strategies and certain organizations that were actually doing this and really worked um, across the board to say, how do we make sure that these outcomes are coming to fruition? What do we need to do? to get more resources to these environments or connect the dots around this kind of work. I think the meeting people where they are is a really important one. You heard that in the last session. How do you provide all the supports that you have to the entrepreneurs when maybe they don't know you have them? And two, they won't enter into maybe the organizations or buildings or areas where the supports are, are provided currently. How do we change that and bring resources to entrepreneurs and meet them where they are, exactly where they are in their, in their trajectory of their entrepreneurial um, goals and work? So this part is very specific to the city and the county. We had city and county partners from the start um, utilizing and leveraging their resources and having their buy-in to want to be more supportive and help this. So this was created um, during our time together to really provide the city with a menu of options on where and how they could engage differently. This is really a 20 page document, but I only pulled out like three pages to show you that this is another thing that we did. We were looking at policies, we were looking at procedures, we were looking at programs, we were looking at realigning resources, um, collaborating better together and figuring out where everyone could take accountability and make a change. I think the really important part of our work was we had this mentality of not only a coalition of the willing, 
But if you want to participate with us, it's really about what resources do you control and what your environment is and how can you shift them to the greater good versus me pointing a finger at Rob and telling him if only UNM would do this, we'd all be better off. So this was um, a template for the city to really be able to be stronger in how they were supporting entrepreneurs and in different roles that they can take. And you can see the different categories that um, were lifted up, including large purchaser, purchaser procurement. So how do you buy locally? And so what we offered as a coalition, moving resources together, um, collaborative grant writing, best practices of what works locally, and data and evaluation. And our data was really steeped in actual data with different groups sharing and looking at different population level outcomes, not as a way to point a finger, but to say, here's what's happening, here's the reality, what does this tell us, what do we need to do? And this chart shows the end of our initiative. So when I showed you that lovely little banquet wedding table set up, this is how we ended up um, coordinating ourselves at the very end. So you can see all the intersections and the different ways we were integrating with each other. Um, one of the case studies, people always say, what are your successes? And there are multitudes, but one of the ones that we really loved was actually in partnership with the Kauffman Foundation. It was called the Mayor's Innovation Prize Program. So we took the SWOT analysis and all the things the entrepreneurs had told us from the planning year, and we said, all right, how do we support nonprofits, education institutions, community groups coming together and working more collaboratively together um, and, and how do we give them the resources to do that? Because it takes resources. Um, we can all want better things, but sometimes we need resources, including dollars to, to make those changes. And so this grant program was started with the Albuquerque Community Foundation specifically to encourage some of the closing of gaps that we saw in our ecosystem. And you can see some of the different results that were achieved out of this. And now you're gonna get a case study on the Innovation Academy and their trajectory from the start of this um, from my friend, um, Professor Rob Del Campo. So I'll turn it over to him. Great, thanks Robin. And thanks um, for, um, for being here today and giving me the opportunity to kind of talk a little bit about City Alive and the Living Cities Project before that, and then how Innovation Academy kind of fits into it um, as a case study and kind of a deep dive into one of these programs. So. Going through the presentation is almost like a little history lesson on where we were and I feel like what I've been doing like the past like six or seven years of my life pre-COVID, I mean it still feels like it's 2019 so I don't know, but uh, in each of those tables I feel like I was on at one point in time, so I have a, a broad view of all the stuff that happened. Um, but the collective impact approach, I think, was actually, you know, valuable and something we take away from this project is probably the biggest learning. Um, and even the, the individual interaction um, that we had uh, amongst the organizations and the people who have even come after the people, right, in those groups have continued, which is incredibly valuable. So around the time that we kind of kicked off this project, um, the, the Innovate ABQ project came online as well. Go back one real quick. Um, um, uh, at the same time, right? And so the Innovation Academy was sort of the university's attempt to say, there's this real estate project, we're trying to do like an innovation district, what are we gonna do on um, the, uh, the academic side? So we launched this program that we kind of termed as the incubator for ideas, businesses, and people, because it's really a lifelong kind of opportunity. So we were really doing entrepreneurship across the curriculum in a lot of different areas. Um, next slide. And so what we did is we kind of created a funnel kind of approach and we decided we needed to, you know, A, meet people where they are, but provide an opportunity for people to get uh, involved in low stakes areas. So we started by offering a, a very low stakes pinch competition, which is not anything different than any other universities are doing. Um, small prizes, a couple hundred bucks to up to a thousand dollars for people just to do a 90 second pitch. And what we saw is that really... Um, uh, increase the diversity of individuals that were participating in our program, but also gave us the opportunity to interact with a lot broader swath of students across the university. So we, we end up with now participating in our program is an incredibly diverse and rich group of folks. Next slide. Um, we realized that we need to be able to take people to the next level in their entrepreneurship journey and expose them to the different opportunities that they have. So with uh, support from the, the City Alive group and many of the individual um, funders as well, they came on board and, and uh, 
and provide an opportunity for us to do this tech navigator challenge. And this really became the thrust of the tech team from City Alive. And of course we sponsored it through the Innovation Academy, but you know, a lot of the, the blood, sweat and tears and mentoring that happened here. So what we did here is basically a tech transfer competition. So people take um, non-confidential summaries, they meet with uh, principal investigators and they decide what they can do with either um, uh, you know, technologies come out of the university or from our two national labs here as to how those might become companies moving forward. Um, and then we gave students enough funding in the prize money that if they wanted to go down the path of taking options or looking at how they might build that out, uh, they actually had the opportunity to do that. The big success here is, is, is the diversity, particularly in technology. Um, we saw the majority of their participants be in the second year uh, female and the majority be uh, students of color as well. Next slide. So we have lots of different programs that we were able to leverage through here. Um, we had an innovation scholars program where people kind of built their way through their college career so they could build their startup alongside their degree and in any area. Our NSF i program funds students mostly who come out of that pitch competition and want to take their, their idea to the next level. Uh, they'll do customer discovery for that and get a little bit of money. We added our, our Comcast pitch deck competition as again, the next level beyond that, really doing an investor pitch um, and really focused on both undergraduate and graduate students. And we have a couple of other things we can do for internships. Um, and we have a, a statewide program to reach to the rural areas through the, um, through the EDA. Next slide. So what this resulted in is in addition to sort of the prize money and such that we uh, we give out, we've also been able to fund over $400,000 of student projects. And quite honestly, a little bit goes a long way. Most of the student businesses that are getting started, and you saw Robin talk about the four areas there, but we certainly have tech stuff that happens. Most of them need about 2000 bucks to get their business started. So if we can give them an award of $1,000 for earning a pitch, winning a pitch competition, they're on their way to success. Um, and so some of the access to capital issues that we discussed you know, we help focus those on students as well, particularly University of New Mexico, when we have well over 40% of our students are Pell eligible, and thus, you know, looking at some of the income gaps there. Then outside investors um, have, have put in, actually it's closer to $2 million now that folks have raised um, for their businesses they've started while they're in school. Next slide. We offer a variety of classes because again, you know, I think we don't take into uh, account the reality that someone mentioned, maybe it was in the previous panel, they said, just because you have an idea and you're working on it, you know, people don't think that's really a business, but also when you're in school and you're working on a, a business or a company or an idea, people take advantage of how much time that really takes to build out. So we tried to build some classes into the curriculum that students could take um, from any discipline that could give them the space within their schedule to actually build something out, whether that be a first business or something they wanna have be a side hustle or hopefully becomes their eventual primary uh, income stream. Next slide. <clears throat> so what I'm most proud about is this, this student snapshot here at the end and who we have um, participating. And I think it's really a reflection of what we have in our community. So first I'll draw your attention to this enrollment slide. So we projected to have maybe you know 10 or 15 students. And when the president of the university asked me to do this, he said, look, I need at the end of the year, I need 10 students I can put Innovation Academy t-shirts on and trot out on stage and take a picture of. He's like, that's your goal. And I said, I think I can do that. So most quickly we, we jumped to like hundred students. Um, and now we've sort of leveled out around 1100 students across the university, across 86 different majors, some working together, many of them solopreneurs. Um, but what I'm most proud of here is that over 50% of them are female over 50% of them are students of color and over 65% are first generation college students. So folks that are usually kind of left out of, of the ecosystem or you know, have that opportunity maybe to do one thing and then fail and then they're out. We wanna provide an opportunity for them to continue to stoke that entrepreneurial flame and move forward. Uh, and sitting as of today, uh, five years uh, into our production of businesses here, we have 116 student companies that are in operation and generating revenue. Um, and I feel that the wraparound services we provide um, are great because 89% of the pitch competition people, if you make it to the finals of that top 10, 89% of them have established a business. So I think that's a great thing to look at as well, because sometimes we provide these things and it doesn't necessarily um, pan out. I think that's the last slide, but let's check. That is the 
That okay. is the last slide. I thought so. All right. Thanks, Robin. So, so I think this is something that, that really came out of, and while it's a UNM branded um, initiative, uh, really kind of came out of the work of City Alive and all of the partners that we work with have come from all of those different tables and continue to come from those different tables and the relationships that were kind of built in this, um, this initiative. Thanks, Thank Lord. You. Oh yeah, go ahead, Robin, go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna say thanks. And um, the reason why I wanted Rob to be here is because that's just one little piece of this really big ecosystem we were looking at. And yet you can see like the different trajectories that took place. Um, we could spend a whole hour and just on the Innovation Academy alone. Thank you for saying that. I think uh, I wanted to bring up again, you know, that um, so, the brief that is going to be published that dives deeper into this City Alive story and around your use of uh, collective impact will be published in October. So everybody, uh, this is sort of a preview of that and stay tuned. Um, but this was a great presentation in that it gave you a real, everyone a clear overview, I think, of a lot of the moving parts. I think the brief will also kind of bring that together for people and again, I think the um, presentation by Rob was a great example of one of dozens of activities that were unleashed through this collective impact process over the six years. And so uh, great summary of that. And let's maybe kick it off with our Q&A now. And I'm gonna start with one question and then we'll dive into some of the ones that are coming through the Q&A. Folks, if you have any questions about collective impact, things you'd always love to know, things that you had questions about that you heard in Robin or Rob's uh, presentations, go ahead and start putting your questions there in the Q&A and we'll get those answered. Um, so I'll start by asking, after having direct experience with this initiative for six years, how would you describe collective impact? And uh, what's your feeling about using that methodology, you know, in retrospect now? Like what are your, some of your lessons learned and your thoughts and feelings about that? Yeah, I mean, I still think collective impact is the way to go, especially solving large scale challenges making sure that you're lifting up your assets and figuring out how to coordinate and be more effective, especially when you put community voice or the voice of the folks that you're doing this with and for in the center so that everybody can hear this is this isn't working for me, or this is what's working for me, or this is what I need, and then collectively can figure out how they can respond to that with the resources that they can leverage. Um, so I think from that standpoint, it's really important. The other piece that's important, it, it's really, I think, important to have um, a lever where we can say, these are our collective goals. How are we going to get to them? And everybody sees that they can put in together. So I'm sure Rob can share, share stories with you. Like you just heard the president thought, let's get 10 students. They got 100 the first year. Like, why is that important? And how did the collective folks sitting at that table or the different partners help to support the work they were trying to do there? And what were the outcomes? So that's important. Um, I think collective impact can be really um, hard in the sense when you're dealing with that many people and that many organizations who are used to having power and authority. Um, and also we, we create these situations, right? So if I'm dealing with nonprofit organizations or community organizations, they're competing for resources. That's what we've set up. And so now we're saying, hey, tell us what's not working in your organization. They're like, I'm not going to tell you what's not working in my organization. You may not fund me. So you're trying to um, uncover the successes, but you're also trying to uncover where can things be better. And you have to create an atmosphere of trust. And that's very hard to do. It takes time. The other piece is what was talked about in your last panel, which is looking at historic um, racism, um, racial equity, um, where we have a lot of challenges around cultural and community competencies to understand um, each other, speaking different languages, understanding that people's lived experiences are very different. And so I think that that's a really underlying factor that comes to play over and over and over again in collective impact that doesn't always show up on like the goals, but um, it's something to take into consideration. But at the end of the day, I would totally do it all over again 
um, because I think it's necessary and vital. Yeah, I think I would just add that. So, you know, when we were <clears throat> when we were getting ready for the session here, I was like, I better look up what the real definition of collective impact is here, because I mean, I think I know what we're doing, but I got to go academic on you a little bit. But I, I think everything that Robin said is, is absolutely accurate, but I would just add emphasis on the trust piece. I mean, it's just so incredibly important. And to be completely honest, there are some some people who were participating in the project who never got to that level. Um, and the reality is they were just kind of left out and left by the wayside. So, you know, I mean, obviously there are steps you could do and ways you could build trust and all that kind of stuff, but, but everyone has to be trustworthy and has to be willing to take on that sort of risk of, of not being the loudest voice in the room or the quote unquote most important voice in the room or the most respected. And, and there's a reality that some people aren't going to do that, right? They're not going to get on board with that. And that's the difficult piece. I think that we and struggled with, but it took us a while to kind of figure out as to how to kind of, you know, we want to be inclusive, but if you're not going to play by these rules, right, how do we, how do we balance, you know, helping the entire um, uh, community with, you know, making sure there are people who have these shared kind of values and ideals and that kind of thing. And I think that's where you've seen um, uh, the, the, or the organizations continue to work together or the individuals continue to work together as the, the, we've rolled off the project. Yeah, I mean, one of the pieces that was alluded to, but there are many, many, many um, groups that were created through this work that focused on specific items um, and strategies that are still continuing on to this day. Can you talk a little bit about some of those tensions that you were mentioning there, Rob, just in terms of navigating so many stakeholders? And, you know, Robin, you had brought up this term when we were when we were working on the brief um, about the coalition of the willing, you know, and what that meant. And how do you balance the coalition of the willing with also needing to be inclusive? And how did you kind of dance with with that uh, in terms of this collective impact initiative? And then I have one more kind of uh, nerdy academic, I guess you could say, question about collective impact after that. But first, let's let's talk about how you balanced uh, inclusion and coalition of the willing. I mean, I can start with what we started with, which is we knew we wanted to focus on the four types of entrepreneurs and literally do an asset-based approach. So what existed in the ecosystem and did not. So for us, the inclusivity around organizations joining was, did you have a policy, a program, a resource, or some kind of work that impacted one of those four types of entrepreneurs or more? And I'll give you an example of that because some people were like, that's not inclusive. Well, if you came to the table and said, listen, Albuquerque is only going to change if we focus on early childhood education. It's like that may be very important, I'm not arguing with that, but we're specifically trying to focus on our entrepreneurial ecosystem. So we need um, participants who are directly involved in that piece. So that was one. As far as other inclusivity, when we went out and did our scan of entrepreneurs, we really wanted to make sure that we were looking for non-traditional entrepreneurs, people who don't identify as entrepreneurs, making sure that we were going to different parts of our community, um, lifting up particular challenges as well as strengths of like our indigenous community, our Latinx community, our immigrant community, our refugee community, our African-American community, and making sure that we were not um, just focused on like the successful white male tech entrepreneur. So for inclusivity, it was really important for us to get different narratives and different information from different people who are actually entrepreneurs. And, and Rob, um, please feel free to add. Yeah, I mean, I think there was intentional recruiting as well, right? We had to really kind of say, hey, we need you at the table for this reason or the other reason. Um, I think you had asked as well, you know, how did we deal with some of this sort of competing demands and the, the strife? And I think there were really opportunities to, you know, have positive synergy, right? Two plus two equal in five was where we saw those things. And Robin mentioned one other initiative we had, which was this, um, this pathway program for, for, um, uh, for community college students, right? To complete like a two-year degree and then work their way up to a master's degree. And how do we build that out? Well, the reality is, is that unless the four-year university and the community college, you know, collaborate there, you're not going to get any 
support from any sort of external organization to make something like that happen. But if you have the structure of this kind of, you know, organization and there's that backbone that really reinforces the necessity of that relationship, I think it really got reinforced. So we were successful in procuring some funds. Um, we, you know, launched the program, we got it kind of going and there was a lot of interest and that sort of thing. And we continue to work with those folks to this day. But the reality is if there wasn't infrastructure to do something like that, it would have taken forever. You know, how do you find the right person? Who's the right person to talk to over here? Who's the right person to talk to over here? Well, I don't know, you know, who's going to get the lion's share of the money and who's not. And, but in this sort of um, environment, it's, it, it really went a lot more quickly, you know? So I think it's kind of, it supercharges this stuff that occasionally takes all, forever or never happens. You know, the piece too about how we dealt with like um, what I would say large voices are large egos in the room or power dynamics is I think that um, the more and further we went along, everybody was normed to this is what we're here to do. This is what we want to do. And we got to leave our egos and other dynamics at the door. And so if there was a, a, a player that wasn't really participating in the way that was aligned with the work we were trying to do, as Rob, as Rob said, they sort of got left behind because organizations and groups starting to collaborate together to solve some of these challenges and, and that party wasn't included or parties um, because they they saw it as a very I or I centric thing versus a we centric thing. Yeah, you know, I think it also helps some of these groups align their priorities like for funding as well. You know, if if they walk in and say, well, this tech navigate, what are you talking about? That's not a priority for us. And then everyone else in the room says, you know what? It's not my organization, but you should probably fund this. Um, I mean, that, that kind of happened as well. Um, so I think that that was, that was really useful too. What I think is really fascinating, and then I wanna dive into some of the more technical questions in the chat um, is, you know, Collective Impact has a wealth of knowledge about how to structure initiatives like this. It has the five principles and other things that we'll kind of outline also in the brief and give other practitioners here um, lots of resources um, so they can dive deeper into this story. But um, just to kind of bring it down to the ground level, how did you learn how to do Collective Impact? Like kind of who first introduced this to you and who helped uh, sort of create the structure because there's some commonalities across collective impact initiatives and what i was really blown away by is that there is so much information about how to structure how to run and how to do these types of initiatives these days maybe there wasn't six years ago but i'd be curious you know now you can go on to the collective impact forum for example and there's a wealth of resources about this so yeah what was your initial learning about how to structure a collective impact initiative our initial learning was um, our whole collective impact initiative got launched by being part of the Living Cities Integration Initiative that had already been working on collective impact focused in different cities. And we were part of round two. So they were already aligning with the collective impact forum and looking at all the best practices and what was coming up, whether it was education, workforce development, entrepreneurship on what needed to be present and how it needed to be structured. And so we took the best of learnings at that time and tried to also recognize that place is very important. And just because something worked in one city or area doesn't mean it will be applied here. So we took the very best of the framework and then tried to morph it to fit our needs and the cultural competencies um, and specifics in our city. And, and as I said, if you look at that original structure of like I call the wedding table, that was the best practice at the time. And then we morphed, we as a team morphed from that to say, hmm, we may have needed that in the beginning, but this is really how we're operating now. Yeah, I think that the, your governance journey is, uh, is uh, a, a good part of the story uh, yeah. there as well. Um, Rob, did you want to chime in on that before I jump into this next question? Right ahead. Ditto. Okay. We're right. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. Um, so I'm going to jump into the Q&A here. Uh, I'm going to take the first question by uh, Eric Renz Whitmore. He says, another success that came out of City Alive, I believe, was the Co-op Capital Initiative. I'm wondering if Robin could tell us a bit more about how that came together. 
Well, big shout out to Eric Rins Whitmore, who is one of our participants. And if I had to name everybody, we'd be here for the next nine hours. So thank you. He's a great ecosystem builder and supporter. So Co-op Capital was specifically a relation or is a relationship-based lending tool for capital. And it was focused um, in this collective impact initiative on entrepreneurs who can get access to capital, whether it was based on um, collateral, credit score, or even the kinds of identity that they had. And so we recognize access to capital is a huge element for entrepreneurs either to start or grow a business and that they couldn't move forward. So we worked um, with New Center Credit Union as well as other participants, including philanthropy, to um, then take a product that already existed and, and scaled it um, throughout the city to support homegrown micro entrepreneurs and those who couldn't get um, access to capital, even through alternative structures like CDFIs. Um, and it was one of the gaps that we filled and co-op capital ended up being is a huge success story. It continues to be present to this day in New Mexico. And there are other organizations within City Alive that embraced co-op capital and are now growing it on their own in their own organizations. So it was really an identifier that came up during our planning year. I need capital. Here's why I can't get it. I can't go to an alternative provider. I don't have the collateral they need. Well, if we really want to support business growth, and we really want to do things differently, we need to figure out a way to get people capital differently. And we're going to be moving into a break here in a little bit, but I want to jump down to a question by Faye Horowitz. It's a, uh, I think a, it's an interesting question in terms of thinking about the, some of the challenging dynamics of working with collective impact. Um, and so I'm going to read that here and, uh, get your get your response rob and robin so Faye asks some of the detractors of the collective impact model have concerns or some of the detractors of the collective impact model have concerns that having a backbone organization that is also a peer with other organizations can create a potentially damaging power dynamic did you experience this at all and how did you navigate it also did you think it would be better if the backbone organization is more on a different level so that they are not in a position to be seen as a threat by fellow organizations. So, so first of all, maybe we should just quickly say, you know, in the collective impact method or model, there is generally one organization that takes on the responsibility for all of the coordination and they are formed in different ways, but this is what the backbone is called. And this will be, there'll be more information about this in the brief, but you can also look it up pretty much anywhere that you read about uh, collective impact. So. That's a bit about what a backbone is. And then Robin, what are your thoughts on some of these tricky questions? And I think we'll probably close with this. <laughs> That's you know. a good, very good tricky question, Faye. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but she's right and it's true. It's accurate. So yeah. I think whatever backbone organization you have, there's always going to be challenges with it. And there's always going to be power dynamics. And I think that one of the iterations that are happening in like the work phase doing in forward cities is looking deeper into what original backbones were and some of the challenges that come up with that based on power dynamics and based on some of the, the things that you um, that she lifted up in her question. So who and where and what is the appropriate backbone and also given that um, every city is a little bit different. So I think my response is I think that power dynamics and equity are big pieces of what we're still working through in so many different ways. And they show up in collective impact over and over and over again. And to be aware of them, to try to mitigate them as much as possible and build trust through it, and then figure out how to um, minimize those impacts with a backbone organization. And maybe um, if I had to do the work all over again, you know, we would have just done a planning year and said, well, where should this live? 
but it's it's a very interesting dynamic um, and it's one that I think we're going to continue to try to answer and, it, and I think it should be explored. I would I would add that you know in this case it was it was interesting because you know we did set up this autonomous kind of backbone organization rather than just say like University of New Mexico U this lives here this takes the lead and I thought that was very valuable um, but interestingly enough it's um, the way that we kind of set things up it provided for you know people who were eager to participate kind of got to kind of not necessarily have the louder voices, but you kind of raise yourself up almost in terms of prominence within the organization or in terms of the impact of your, your projects by the number of people you're participating with, um, you know, the amount of times you're showing up to the meetings, right? If you're going and putting in the work, you know, your projects are going to get, you know, going to get attention, right? Um, but you had the opportunity to really kind of evolve within the organization. I mean, I think I started out just in one of these like community, like groups just to get, get input and then kind of, you know, weaseled my way onto all these different these different groups as we moved up but you know the coalition of the willing also has to do with the coalition of the people willing to do the work as well and i think you know having the this backbone organization helped us to kind of identify this who's been doing stuff who do we need at these tables and, and that kind of stuff so it is a slippery slope but i think uh, it can be mitigated there's another piece to that that i think is so important it's what the collective impact what are you trying to do and if you are trying to do system change and big systems like universities and cities and counties that have lots and lots of resources and may not be deploying them as effectively or as collaboratively as the community would want. Um, that's why there's a lot of involvement from that, from those organizations. And oftentimes you do want leaders who are gonna step up and say, I'm gonna listen, I'm gonna learn, and I'm going to make changes to my policies and my resources, and I'm going to do things differently. And so it's sort of a slippery slope. I agree again with everything that Faye brought up. And you want to have those people at your table, because if you're going to enact true systems change, they've, they've got to be there and willing to say, I'm going to alter things based on what I'm learning here. And what I can also hear too is that, you know, there is a question, Faye and Robin, you know, about um, how, how the formation of the backboard organization happens, depending on existing or desired power dynamics. And that is something that a lot of collective impact initiatives are still, I think, experimenting around. And I don't think that there's probably one way to do it. But I think that having that, uh, maybe not just doing it one way or the traditional way, it, it might be worthwhile really digging into what would be best for the community. You know, Robin said that maybe they would have rethought that part um, in some in, in some cases. Uh, so anyway, that's an area of innovation, basically. And I think it gets back to the tensions you brought up in your questions, Faye. 